just know that you can do it. It is absolutely possible. You do have to plan for it. This is the business of architecture. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for managing and building an architectural practice that doesn't get in the way of the architecture. If you haven't already discovered the four pillars of the smart practice, head on over to smartpracticemethod.com for a free on-demand video course. Again, that's smartpracticemethod.com. Today we speak with Karen Compton, a principal of A3K Consulting, which is a consortium of business management consultants specializing in the AEC environment. In this capacity, Ms. Compton oversees a team of professionals focused on the development of transformative business strategies and solutions that reflect an organization's long and short-term goals. Ms. Compton has more than 20 years of experience in business management, including business development, marketing and strategic planning, and more than five years in the public sector where she served as the director of the small business program for a major water utility. Additionally, she is the executive producer and co-host of a podcast video cast series called Breaking the Silence of Design that she runs with her friend Gabrielle Bullock, FAIA. You can check that out on YouTube. It focuses on issues of justice, equity, diversity, inclusion in the design and construction profession. In this episode, Karen and I talk about how to prepare your architectural practice for an upcoming recession. Buckle in your seatbelts and let's get on with the show. So Karen, you're up first. We look forward to hearing what you have to say about how firms, especially particularly smaller firms, can harden themselves and prepare themselves for recession and economically difficult times. Karen? Okay. So there were just a couple of things I really wanted to kind of convey to the people who are listening. And I went back and I kind of looked at everything that you said, and you're absolutely right. You're not trained and educated um, as an architect to run a business. You go into architecture because you love design or because you want to create spaces and places for people. And it's tough, right? Because what ends up happening is one day you wake up and decide, okay, I'm going to be a firm owner. Um, And ownership means something very different. You and I have had this conversation before. Ownership means something very different than just being in a practice. It's the move from doing the work to leading the work. And it's the move from working in the business to working on the business. And it truly requires at the very beginning a mindset shift to understand that day to day, um, you are developing the sustainability, business sustainability of your organization. That's first and foremost. Absolutely, let me interject there, Karen. It's, 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 I love, I love, so this idea of not, not being trained to about the business. If you would have asked, what's really interesting, if you would have asked me 15 years ago what it means to run a business, I didn't even understand that question. So in other words, I thought a business was the invoicing. I thought a business was just making sure we get paid on time. I thought a business was kind of like, hey, if you collect, if you get projects and collect, then you can do the work and everything's hunky-dory. But you said something very, used a word, you said leading, leading the work. Yes. You have to lead the work. It's not just, yes, you have to get your invoices paid. Yes, you have to collect on your money. Yes, you have to bill for the work. But you also have to lead a group of individuals and yourself in the beginning to identify work, um, business development. You then have to manage the client and the client's expectations. That's doing the work. But when you're actually leading a practice, ironically, that's the part that you end up having to put to the side for a minute to actually think about where do I want to grow my business? How do I want to make it sustainable? What are the people and resources that I need in order to do the work if I can't all do it all myself? How am I going to capitalize? Those are all business issues that we really need to focus on um, in order to be working in the business. I mean, working on the business, not working in the business. So recession proofing really begins with understanding your role and your responsibility 
as a business owner to say, okay, I'm going to have to put aside the thing that I'm actually passionate for for a minute and, and look at what do I actually have to do to harden, you know, using your word, um, harden my firm against the cycles that naturally happen within business. Beautiful. I'm curious, for those of you on today, how many recessions have you been through? Let's have a little test here. Let's see who's been through the most number of recessions. Have you been through zero recessions? Maybe you started up, you started your practice since the last recession. Maybe you experienced that one as an employee. Have you been through that one? Maybe you were around during the one of 2001. That was the first one that I experienced. And so I, I, I can't really speak to anyone's before that, but I have a feeling there was one in the 1990s, the late 1990s. There was one around 1990. I know for sure there's a big one around 1980. How many recessions have you personally been through? Drop that in the chat box and let's see what we have here. Karen, let's have a look. Let's see what these people I'm afraid. Say. Curious. I'm not going to tell you how many I've been through because then you can kind of sort of figure out my age. <laughs> What I will course, say, what I, so what I will we, say. Here is, we have, here we have, Karen, we have, we have three, we have four, we have two, we have zero, we have three, one, two, one, one, two, five to seven, uh, two, three, two, four, four. So obviously a lot of you seven. So a lot of you have been through quite a number of recessions, which brings up the, the fact that recessions happen. And we they're know. cyclical. Yeah. There's, there's some, there's somewhat predictable and I hate to say that because I'm not an economist you know but the fact is the design and construction industry is cyclical roughly every 10 years we this happens and the error that we usually make largely is that firms tend to focus on making the most out of boom times and do very little planning for what happens in the bust but the truth is the bust is fairly predictable. You know, we ride the wave as long as we want to, but the bust is 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 fairly predictable. It runs every, roughly every 10 years. Um, there are some exceptions to that. The AEC, generally speaking, tends to do incredibly well um, in natural disasters. So hurricanes, floods, and fires really tend to uh, buoy the AEC industry. So all of the challenges that we have right now with um, climate change um, really kind of seem to be playing to our favor. But that notwithstanding, it's predictable. So there are long-term challenges. There are some serious long-term challenges. Um, lack of available workers, uh, ongoing supply chain issues. Those are predictable variables um, that are going to be here for a minute. Um, as people look at and continue to retire, um, and we don't have a long-term uh, response yet for, for supply chain issues. What are you most concerned about regarding a recession? So you're obviously, you attended this 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 webinar today. We want to over-deliver for you today. What is it? And we can also custom tailor the content today based upon what your experience and what your worries are. If everyone would just drop in, just so we can see from our side, what are your top fears or concerns about a recession? Like, what is that like for you? What is that like in your world? What are your worries and concerns about that? And as these come back, I may read some out, but uh, Karen, back to you. Yeah, please, because uh, I, I would love to be able to address what people's biggest concerns. There are so many concerns, you know, you, you not having adequate work, huge issue because your 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 expenses are fixed. How are you going to meet those demands? Um, that's probably the, the largest singular worry. Um, and then depending upon what the size of your practice is, your response is gonna be different. So let's talk about different strategies in terms of hardening, right? So if you're a very small firm, in other words, you're let's say less than five people. If I say to you diversify, you're gonna look at me like I'm crazy and go, wait a minute, I'm one person. How does one person diversify? So you have to be realistic and very pragmatic about it and say, OK, diversification may not look like you doing work in a different market sector, because, of course, you're probably doing the work and getting the work and everything else. But it may also but it may look like doing a different service, um, whether that's project management, whether that's teaching. That is a level of diversification that can happen on the individual level that allows you to kind of manage through the swing. That is very practical um, sound advice for somebody who was in a practice of five people or less. Like I said, it's incredibly difficult to quote unquote diversify when you're by yourself. And I know many of your listeners 
are sole practitioners. So I don't want to give any kind of advice that they just kind of roll their eyes and go, that doesn't make any sense. So just kind of recognizing where you are, if you are a single practitioner, that would be my first thing to really look at is what are the, are there other levels of service or are there other aspects of design and construction that I can practice in order to kind of weather these ebbs and flows? That's my, my first thought. If you're slightly larger and you're doing projects in a variety of different market types, now we're getting into something different. So in recession, um, as most of you already know, the first thing that goes is discretionary spending. And the same thing is true in the design profession. The first thing that usually feels the hit are the discretionary markets. Those tend to be just restaurant design, hospitality, um, what else kind of falls in there, discretionary retail, those kinds of markets tend to pull back pretty quickly. Um, I have a friend of mine who does hotels and he I use him kind of as the canary in the coal mine for what's going on in life because he'll tell me in a minute whether or not his hotels have stopped. Um, but if that's you, then you may want to take a look at what are the markets that you currently service and are they all discretionary? Are some of them more discretionary than others? Single family home can be very discretionary because it is largely driven by whether or not the owner of that home um, is or feels flush at that moment. And so that is challenging. Um, in those times, the markets that generally tend to do well are, are the ones that we'll call institutional, you know, education, public, civic. Um, but what I think is really important is to really truly understand what of what you're doing is, you know, in a discretionary area or market. What can you add as a service? And then what are the markets that kind of work on a different cycle than the regular downturn? Traditionally, we call this business continuity planning. Um, I teach fifth year pro practice um, at Cal Baptist um, here in Southern California. And I, I teach business continuity planning every year. And I've uh, every time I think about changing the topic, I go, no, I'm not gonna change it because we don't teach people um, how to plan consistently for the ebbs and, ebbs and flows of business. And it's not just for planning for natural disasters, but it is for planning for predictable economic downturns. So that's the one. The one thing we know is that downturns are going to happen. Uh, a number of the, uh, unsurprisingly, the top two concerns that people have are, of course, uh, cash flow problems, not having enough cash flow, and losing and maintaining staff. We know yeah. that it's so hard to find staff, especially at a time like right now when we're so busy, and there's this, you know, it's just so detrimental to the profession when we have to start laying people off. They they jump out to other professions. Maybe they even leave architecture. You know, it, it leaves a sour taste in employees' mouth it can potentially drain the budget of a practice if they're wondering how, am I just trying to put a bridge here for a couple months or are we going to yeah. something for long? Because the last thing you want to do is enter into a recession, draw down all your reserves trying to keep your staff and then get to the point where now you've you've bled yourself dry. Now you have to lay them off and you have no reserves left. So these are the two major concerns that we're seeing unsurprisingly, which is you know dealing with maintaining that cash flow and then losing employees and staff. So let's go to the second one first um, maintaining the employees and staff for small practices in the last couple of years i found something um, kind of interesting intriguing and that is um, i know probably six or so firms um, that have very good relationships with each other that tend to borrow each other's staff in order to keep them busy so it acts more than just a bridge, but it acts as a safety net, for lack of a better word. But to be very clear, those relationships existed before the recession. So the firms that I'm thinking of, and there are about six of them, one has about 20 people, one has about five or six, the other has 10. And they kind of act in a, a kind of a consortium of sorts. Um, so that if some somebody is ebbing and somebody and that somebody else is not, or someone is flowing and someone else is not, 
there's at least the ability to try and keep those staff um, busy. And I have found that to be really interesting as of late, as people try and think about how to deliver service differently. Um, and I'm not just talking about within the recession, but kind of post COVID in a, uh, in a remote hybrid format, how do people deliver service differently? And I think that has opened up a, a myriad of options and opportunities that previously either were not considered or were considered to not be very viable. So I've seen that and it's been relatively successful. That's fantastic. Um, Karen, when, so what could you, what are the steps to business continuity planning? Obviously, you feel it's important oh. enough that you keep it in you keep it in your your curriculum, your coursework. What are the steps here that that we should all be aware of? First, assess where your exposure is. Where is your current work? What is likely to stop, and and for what period of time? And I know some people say, "Well, I don't know." And the truth is, if we really stop and think about it, we can be fairly accurate with our prediction. It's difficult because sometimes you're sitting there with the hard reality that some of these things may stop immediately and that's quite frightening. That's that's a very real thing. But the first is to really truly understand where is your exposure. The second is to define where can you pivot? You know, do I need to develop a different skill set in my boom time? so that in my bust, I can actually do well? Do I need to develop a strategic partnership or relationship to keep my people busy? You, you can't do that in the bust. You have to do that in the boom. So assess where you might be able to pivot and develop what your strategies and tactics are gonna be at that point. Develop relationships or identify relationships and networks that can act as that bridge. Um, and again, that's not something you can do in a boom time. That's something, or, or in a bus time, it's something you have to really do in, in the boom when you're not feeling so stressed and aggravated. And then, like I said, at that point, really define what's the strategy, what's the time period that you're trying to cover to the best of your knowledge and understanding. And then what are the tactics that you need to execute on in order to move forward? That's the oversimplified version of business continuity planning. And then you run scenarios. You know, what if? What if my bank calls their loan? What if um, I can't keep my people busy? I'd rather have you do your what if planning um, when you have work than doing your what if planning as you're watching your work diminish. You, you get two very different responses when you're doing it in the face of clarity, it's not a panic driven response. It's framed <clears throat> and contextualized and analytical and clear. But when you're doing it in, in the panic mode, it's emotionally driven and the, and the decisions are usually very poor. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, too often we see in these experiences, people cutting, cutting back in the practice, cutting expenses, cutting, 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 and they cut so deep and so hard, they cut all the muscle. Yeah. And so what happens to a skeleton that doesn't have any muscle? There's nothing left. They've cut too far. And, and there's nothing to say that exactly. And there's nothing to say that you <clears throat> cannot or should not cut cut costs. We all all of us um, our expenses or our costs increase in boom time. But but there are certain things that we need to be very clear about. <clears throat> where's the threshold of the cut? Otherwise, to your point, you begin to cut muscle and and you know not not fat. Karen, there was a question here about, in the example of the firms who were sharing employees, do you know the details of that? Do you know if they were, um, how they did the transaction there, if they were hiring the other people out as 1099 contractors or anything about the, the way they structured that? Yeah, from what I, from what I recall, <clears throat> they actually had a work share agreement between the three firms. They had worked out rates. Um, they had worked out, um, they had worked out rates, terms, and they were, at, and the work was actually done um, under the billing of the of the firm for which the person was employed, <clears throat> and then the the invoice was transferred on the back end. So the so the person doing the work didn't actually see or experience a different payment. They were just being kept busy on somebody else's work, and their firm is paying them. 
those were the things I really wanted to kind of impart. I know what it's like to be a small practice owner. And I know what it's like to feel the fear of, first of all, taking the risk to even go on your own and then to have to kind of navigate the headwind of it all creates a lot more anxiety. Just know that you can do it. It is absolutely possible. You do have to plan for it. Um, and that's really what I wanted to leave leave your audience with. I've, I know many of them. Um, like you said, I've been a, a, a guest of yours on more than one occasion. Um, and I do believe that there is a possibility, you know, the, the opportunity to navigate this and navigate it well, but you have to do it in advance. You have to really think about it in advance. Beautiful. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.